welcome to uh, the Bill Bryce uh, TED Seminar. It's nice to see uh, folks coming in. You'll learn a lot from Bill. Uh, I've ridden around Australia uh, on these 45s with Bill a number of years ago. We've raced at Daytona on these motorcycles a few years ago. Uh, he's forgotten more than I know about 45s and um, he's kindly offered us his knowledge amongst brethren, old motorcycle fans, uh, male and female, on uh, how you prepare your motorcycle when you park it through the cold or winter spell. And uh, hopefully Keith from America's here because they get pretty cold. Uh, and how you bring it back to life at the uh, when it's time to get it out of the shed. That's tomorrow. Oh, is it? Excuse me. So which is today, Bill? Touring. Oh. Preparing a bike for touring. Okay. Uh, rewind. Start again. Uh, Bill has got another one tomorrow, which you won't miss. This one is um, preparing a bike for touring and what you should do when you've got a number of miles to do. So with that, I'll hand over to Mr. Bill Bryce. Thanks, Tom. Hello, everyone. Um, in, in preparation for this, I just thought I'd uh, get on the net and have a bit of a look and see what they recommended for um, choosing a bike for uh, to ride around Australia wasn't a question for me because um, I only knew these things, that's all I've ever had oh, in the last 40 years anyway. And um, so some people might want to pick up something to, to ride a bike, you know. But so I looked on there and they, they were suggesting for classic bikes, 1980 BMW, Goldwing, Evo, Harley, anything over a thousand cc's. To me, that sounds pretty damn boring, you know, to me that's a modern motorcycle, but so to ride an old bike around, I like a bit more of a challenge, so I mean, I'll, I've always looked for something older, and um, as Tony said, we've had a great time riding these old girls, but there are many other guys riding around, uh, doing long trips at the moment, on uh, a couple of guys who've done really good trips on mattresses, and there's some guys on um, fellow sets, a group of them have been doing huge trips just like we did when we went around Australia. And then of course there's also um, the Vincents or uh, Ducatis or early uh, jet bikes, Z9s, thousands of Triumphs or A65 BSAs. I mean all of those things are a great thing. But you don't have to limit yourself at that. I mean there's, um, when we came down from Darwin towards Catherine we bumped into these um, Looney guys on Honda CT110 Hosty bikes, and uh, you know, there was 70 of them, and they were having a great time on this Hosty challenge. I mean, there they were traveling huge distances on these little bikes, so uh, it doesn't need to restrict you at all. In fact, some guys ride those C10110s to uh, Cape York and back on their own, unsupported. So, you know, sometimes people will tell you that you can't do it on on old bikes, whereas, you know, if you're a bit uh, careful about your preparation and also uh, mechanical, you can you can go on anything. I mean, I, when I crossed the Nullarbor on this many years ago, I saw a, a little Japanese man riding a push bike. Man, you know, didn't even have a motor, and yet he was covering huge distances, so anything's possible. But an article in this magazine came out a few years ago and there's a guy from Perth asking questions. He wanted to run extra tall gearing on, on one of these bikes for uh, travelling and what have you. And, you know, the, the, they asked the question in the magazine and the guy says he wanted to put in a four-speed but top gear's the same so it makes no difference. And he was asking the question, you know, can I run two extra teeth on the motor and what have you? And, and they're very knowledgeable uh, shop that they use regularly for answers on here. You know, his reply was, um, you know, the original gearing was only designed to do 60 miles an hour on an old bike. Changing the gearing taller will place a lot of load on the engine, which it was never made for anyway. In a military utility bike, not a sports tourer. When gearing is changed to a taller ratio, the engine cannot pull the gearing and you apply more throttle and the bike speed does not increase and you just start using extra fuel. And then it'll start to overheat and it cause engine damage. Well then they asked, him, asked me for an opinion as well. well. I was a bit more polite than by saying that's crap, but that's crap. Um, so, you know, um, 
it doesn't matter what bike you take as well, what you need to do is make sure that you get familiar with the bike. So it does whatever you're taking. Now for instance, your tyres, when you're getting tyres fitted, I always don't like them to go over five years old. Good idea for helmets as well. But when you go to the bike shop, get your tyres fitted, you need to check your wheel bearings. Now, shops that I've worked in, we're more than happy for a customer to come in and feel the wheel bearings, so don't be afraid to ask. If you've got the wheel in there, you can't see it, they might take the bike into another room. Just go up and say, do you mind if I put my finger in the wheel bearings and feel them? Because if you go and do a bearing on, the, on a long trip, you're stuffed. Now, you know, most shops, won't, they won't mind. And if they do mind, why? There's a problem. So, I mean, as I said, the shops I've worked in, it'd be no problem. You just, uh, just say, can I feel the wheel bearings when you... No, you know, and they might say, no, we'll, we'll check. Yeah, good idea to know yourself. And also, I'd be also very careful about how they install them. Wheel bearings can be damaged if they're knocked in care carelessly, and they'll feel all right initially, but premature lifespan will come in. So... So the other thing is, if you're picking a bike for touring, you might also consider if you're going in a group, does the bike fit into the group or, <laughs> or does it not fit into the group? Now, I remember once I went to um, Melbourne for a, I went to a concert and um, I met up with a, um, oh, about 10 guys from the Hog Club, all brand new Harleys, and I was riding this and... Um, we headed off and just past Goulburn I had a little technical issue and they kept coming along saying, how long till you're ready? How long till you're ready? How long till you're ready? I said, don't worry about it, mate, just go. Oh, no, we can't leave you there. I said, just go, please just go. And they were with a friend of mine who I've ridden many times to Melbourne with and um, he said, don't you worry, he'll beat you down there. Well, I found the problem, got it going and once I'm going, I don't stop. And sure enough, I got into Melbourne, to a regular place, which is at the concert, found, put my tent up, had my bike sit there, grabbed my beer, and I was having it sitting in my chair, and in they all arrive. Oh, how'd you get here? Have you got a ute? So, so but as I say, you need to just sort of pick a bike that you're in with a group. You don't want to be an odd man out. So, obviously... You need to know your own bike if you're going to be um, servicing it or maintaining it on the side of the road. So you need to be familiar with what's expected of the bike. And so you obviously the bike has to be in tip-top condition to go. So we're talking ch chains, tyres, cables. Don't go with any frayed cables. Make sure they're all good before you go. Um, and sometimes on um, twin pull cables, I've been caught before, if you snap the pull cable, the A cable, sometimes you can disconnect the B cable and hook it into the A cable side and work the throttle in reverse and it'll get you going, it'll get you back on the road again. And even some, some carbies, like early Honda 4s, if you snap the cable, you can grab the cradle on the side and pull the cradle up, it'll get you to the next town or something. Same on these things, if you're, not that you're likely to snap one on these because they're piano wire, but you know, you can grab the carby, it'll, it'll, you know, you'll get to the next town and then you'll be able to sort it out. So obviously before you go, um, you need to uh, make sure that everything's right and tipped up ready to go and that means a new battery or a really good battery. Good idea to load test the battery before you go. No good going out with a crook one because it might start you around town a few times but you get out on the open road, they'll die. And you can buy a load tester, I've got one, it only costs 40 bucks. Put it on your battery and you hit the button, it'll load test it there and then for you. Good idea to know that before you go. Now, fuses. I, I don't run with any um, old fuses that um, that can let you down. I like to run new fuses, and I had a fuse holder here somewhere. I, cha I change all my bikes to this type of fuse holder and run these fuses for a couple of reasons. One is you can buy these anywhere. And... Years ago, you know, you have one one fuse in your bike. I carry, I carry that, because if you pop a fuse, you think, huh, oh, was that intermittent or was it, was that really a fault or was there something wrong? So you put one in, and it you've got a short and it pops a fuse. Then what? You've got no fuses, because I only put one in the bike. That's why I carry these, so I can put a couple in. 
and then you work out what's going on. And the other thing is I always carry a, uh, a little test light. And if you do get a short, as it happened to me once, I was riding a Honda 4. Um, up, I was coming up past Eden in the dark on a July night. It had just finished raining, pitch black. And uh, I was coming up this rise and it was, the hill was raised and there was no edge of the road, no sides. And, and I, it was pitch black, cloudy sky. And I pulled over to the side of the road and I was trying to hold the bike like this. There was no road there and a couple of cars went past and I was trying to push the bike up to a safer area. And then a semi-trailer came along. I had nowhere to go. I, he didn't see me, I was pitch black. So I leaned over as far as I could and fell and tumbled me and the bike tumbled and rolled down the hill. Then I had to push it all the way along through the scrub and the bush back to the road to, to work on it. But then I had no lights. I had nothing. I had, so I had to try to sort all that out. So what I always carry is I carry a test light, something like this. And this one's LED, but I normally run them with about six foot of wire. If you've got a dead short, I just put in the fuse holder, I put two little spades in like that. Put my test light on there, and that will illuminate the, this because it's going to earth somewhere in the wiring. So you can use a test light, one, to be seen, two, to look around your bike at night time. So, so you, you, you'll be able to try to find what's going on. And then when you find the short and you fix the short, the light will go out because it's not going to earth anymore. Real good trick to have. And the other thing is if you're using a, like an LED like this, if you're camping, I used to, when I used to camp, I used to hook it onto the battery and you can shove it in the tent and you've got a little bit of a light in the tent there, for, you know, at night time or something like that. So they come in really handy. But as I say, I normally have one about six foot long so you can get all around the bike. I, I've also used a vintage car for touring and it's in the car at the moment. But, but yeah, so... Um, I also carry a few spares. I like to be self-sufficient if you get stuck on the right side of the road with an odd, unusual bike. Because if you go... I remember I rode this to Perth once and I had a friend working there and I went to the Harley dealer, put it up on the bike bench and they just all backed away. They didn't want to know about it. They didn't know anything about it. So, you know, you, once I say, once you're familiar with it, you'll be able to work on it yourself and try to find the faults or, or even just maintain it or checking it regularly, you know. So when you go away, this is a standard coil. So you, and once again, if you know, your, you know your model, you know the weaknesses. And these bikes have a couple of weaknesses. Primary chains, coils, and can pop a head gasket. That's about it. They're, they're very good bikes, but that's a standard coil. Now, you don't want to carry that on the side of the, on your bike as a spare. And when we went around Australia, um, three of us blew coils, Pete included. <laughs> So, I mean, I carry, um, I just carry a Japanese coil like that, and that'll do the same thing. You can put the leads in there, far more compact, and these are made uh, for uh, Z1 Kawasaki's. I don't know why, but it's a six volt. I'm not familiar with them, but it's six volt. I mean, so, and these are six volts. I mean, that's all you need to carry instead of lugging something like that around. And, and if you're, a little bit clever as well. You can actually even and put those inside there. If you've got a crook one of these, you can you can put them inside there to rejuvenate an old original coil. Yep. Apparently, there's a uh, green trike parked in someone's in the entrance way and it's blocking access. Traffic. Looks like a VW trike with LQU.53. Could you come and move it, please? The other things that these, um, you know, can blow a head gasket. So, I mean, I always carry a head gasket packed in, my, in a pannier somewhere. And the other electrical item that could let you down on the front is a relay. Now, these are a six volt bike and they have a really big battery. They don't have a regulator. So a relay could let you down. Now, you, will, you can get around a relay like this because these, these do not regulate the current on six volt. Vintage cars are the same up to 
early 50s. They don't regulate the current. All this does is a, it's a cutout, few, uh, power on, power off. So you can just take it away, disconnect and connect the wiring straight to the generator terminal. So, but what you have to do, all this does is disconnect when you turn the motor off so it doesn't drain the current out of the battery back through the brushes. So you just disconnect the wiring. So, you know, once again, you, you can um, get by without that. But if you're running like jet bikes or more, more modern bikes, they're running alternators. They run alternators like these and electronic ignitions. Now, this is just a couple of samples of electronic ignition. Now, if these fail on the road, you're in trouble. So, I'm, some people carry spares. They very rarely fail, but they can fail. And because these alternators, and this is a source coil, which this is a trigger to tell you where, that tells the ignition where the, uh, when to fire by crankshaft position, these, these are running in oil, in hot oil all the time, and they, they can suffer. They, uh, insulation can break down, oil can, get in, oil can get into them, seek into them, and then they become faulty, particularly when they're hot, might run when they're cold, and the source coils can play up. But you can see they're not big, but they're just about everyone is completely and individually different. So, you, you know, you normally need to know what you've got before you go. You might carry spares. Speaking of spares, I don't carry... This is a tool roll that I carry on this bike. And I've got a few other spanners, but I always pack them either on top of the rack or down low, because that's heavy. You get your weight down low. But I always carry um, a spare condenser. I don't bother carrying um, points. I don't see the point in carrying points. Points don't wear out. They're just a switch. You clean the points. The rubbing blocks very rarely wear out. So, But I do carry condensers. I've had quite a few failed condensers. But this is a very handy thing. If you are oh, just a piece of wire with two alligator clips, you can, buy, you can bypass all sorts of faults or what have you with it. The other thing that this is really good for, if, you, if your battery dies, um, you can go and buy, if you're a six volt bike like this, you can go and buy one of those square dolphin torch batteries and you can just plug that onto your wiring, that onto your dolphin battery and these bikes will run for five hours on those dolphin batteries. And uh, my brother had a 56K model Harley and his battery died and we were on a great race running around the Snowy Mountains. And um, he uh, went and bought to a shop and he bought a, a little car battery, 12 volt car battery, hooked it on with these leads. He rode that for three weeks to, to and from work without any problems. So, I mean, this is a very handy thing. And on one ride, I saw, <laughs> I saw two guys on Indians one guy had failed completely on his ignition and these two, these two blokes had this hooked onto one bike, this hooked onto another bike riding up the highway and this bike was powering that one. Pretty, I'm not advising you to do that, by the way, but <laughs> a bit dangerous. Um, but look, special tools. If you're going away, some special tools. You, you, know, you need to know your bike again. I mean, just I've got a, a couple of odd things here for changing gearing, head bolts, spanners, special ones. So uh, once again, you know your, know your bike because you quite often will have to get yourself out of trouble, um, and which I've had to do occasionally. Um, uh, just one other thing. Uh, um, I want to talk about luggage. And I've followed lots of guys who've just got stuff strapped on the outside any old way. And... You know, they falls off. I mean, I know one bloke, and he's here somewhere. I've picked up his tool bag several times, and his number plate, and his tail light. So, um, you know, stuff hanging on the outside's a bad idea. I like to have everything contained. They make some really good bags now, canvasy type, not canvas, but that modern material, um, waterproof, wonderful for putting gear in. You put one big thing on the top and strap it down. Really good. Um, and if you're, if you're putting, uh, I suggest you'll take a first aid kit if you're going in a group. You only need to take the one, but it's a good idea to have one. Um, and if you 
I'd be strapping your uh, wet weather gear if you've got panniers. I know they're a bit ugly, but they've been on there almost 40 years. But um, you can use some saddlebags. But the trouble is with leather saddlebags, if you're going older style bikes, particularly with rigid frames, you get a lot of hammering on the rear end. And I've seen them just tear the leather, especially when the leather gets a bit old, they tear the bag straight off, bang, you've lost a bag and half your gear and, and your tools. So I know they're ugly and I've never seen anybody else run them, but man, they've been so good. And so, um, yeah, so, but look, there's heaps of good gear now. There's even little um, flexible um, satchels now you can put for petrol in, petrol approved. You can get them in three different sizes. So if you need, if you're doing big distance, you can, um, you know, you can fold them up and put them in there. But if fill them up with fuel, but then they shrink when you're using the fuel. If you tip it out, you're using it, and they can pack up. So you know, there's some good modern stuff out there. So um, I'd be putting the wet weather gear in your left hand side. So you, so you don't have to go to the, the traffic side of the bike. If you, you, know, you pull over in a little narrow spot, good idea to put it in on this side. So you, you know, we're just away from the traffic. Um, good idea to take waterless hand cleaner. You don't have to have water to clean your hands. I remember um, I came back from Perth many years ago on this and I, I snapped a primary chain. Oh man, I was black to the, to the wrists by the time I changed my primary chain. And, um, but, you know, that waterless stuff's now great. Rub it on, just wipe it off, and it's really good. And it doesn't take up much room. Reflective clothing. You, I don't go for it that much, but it's damn safe. If you're riding in a group, you can see someone up the front, you know. It's, it's good to have. Um, now, warm, warm gear or suitable gear for wherever you're going. I know I, um, I've travelled around up in the Snowy Mountains, been up to the Alpine Rally sometimes, and... I used to, uh, I, I put these, what I call hippo hands on. These are fantastic. I put them onto this bike with the, and I don't use that screen. I use, I use this for going down the snowy. And uh, I don't normally wear it on there because on an open face helmet, your beard ends up in your face. You can't see where you're going. But, but in uh, down the snow and up in the Alpine regions, I use the big screen and I still wear an open face. But, you know, with a scarf around it, it's, it works really good. But uh, these are also a military issue for these bikes. They bolt straight on. These are sent... You can see I've been out in the mud a bit. Uh, these are sensational for keeping off the wind and the cold. These leg guards, they're really good. And then, as I said, these hippo hands. You can put these on with a set of old, big old set of mittens. And they are, they are great. And the other thing you can put inside your gloves is like mechanics gloves. They're those little thin rubber ones or dishwashing gloves or the surgical gloves. You know, they're stricky and they take up no room. They keep the rain out and they keep the warmth in. And on any trip, and it's a bit cool, they're fantastic. They work really well. And I know when I was down the Alpine Rally last time, it was minus eight degrees in the morning. And um, in fact, I got my... I got my uh, eggs out of the uh, tent to put them on the frying pan and the whites of the eggs were frozen so that's how cold it was and I had my breakfast, give her a kick in her guts and she fired, no worries and there was BMWs there going, uh, uh, uh and we were the first two to leave on these bikes without any drama. Um, so, uh, uh, yeah, now... It might sound to you like I carry a lot of stuff, and I guess I do, but pack, packing light is fairly important. You want to try to keep the weight off the bike and try to keep it in front of the rear axle, and for not so much behind because, you know, it can, it can shake, your, shake the head around. I know I was working in San Francisco f for uh, a few weeks packing the bikes that went from Australia to the Harley's 100th in 2003. And there was a guy there, he had a soft tail type bike and, you know, we, we'd have to prep, get all the bikes together and then put them all out there and then they'd fly in and then they'd take them away. He came in, he goes, you've done something wrong to my bike. And I said, what do you mean? He goes, well, it, there's something wrong with it, it doesn't handle properly. I went out there and he had uh, a fairly plump missus, but he had bags stacked this high this far out the back, the weight hanging out the back, it was just shaking the head of the bike. And so he said, you ride, uh, it's shaking the head. So anyway, sure, it would do. 
I don't know. So you've just got to be a bit sensible. And the good idea is to pre-pack before you go away and test ride it several days before. That gives you the opportunity to test the bike and to change your, your packing procedures or the gear you're going to take. I know when I, um, before we went around Australia, I mean, I just did a test ride on this. I went to Canberra and back just in one day and, you know, just to test it, run it in. So, oh, <laughs> good idea for a change of clothes. You'd be surprised how dirty you can get just with road grime and what have you riding along. I remember once I went to uh, Ayers Rock, I think, oh, no, it's... Um, oh, Alice, I think somewhere the sales restaurant out there, and I put on I put on my best clothes, and my wife and I walked up there. They wouldn't let us in. <laughs> she reckons it's something to do with my clothes. They were probably a bit dirty, a bit grimy. But so it's a good idea to have a you know reasonable set of clothes, and good idea if, not to have cotton because if you're on the road, you're washing out regularly. Cotton takes too long to dry. So um, now I, I like to. Planning a trip, I like to make reservations in advance. Now, it's not always practical, and it's not always sensible. If you have a if you have a fault on the road, you're not going to make your destination. But at least you can ring and cancel it, and you have to find some alternative. But if you've got a reservation booked, you're not going to try to go too far and ride way past where you you're capable of, or you you know you get get tired. So, and I've done some silly trips like that. I once rode to the um, I went to the World's End Rally in the Flinders Ranges, which is 135 kilometres north of Corn, in a weekend. That's 3,400 kilometres in a weekend. That's silly. That's silly. I'm, I can't do it anymore, but I, I, it's crazy. We got chased by the police, police a couple of times in a charger, but he couldn't catch us. Oh, I wasn't on that. I was on a, a Suzuki. Um, so you know, need to know your limits. Long distance travelling, you need to know your limits. You know how far you can ride or your bike can ride. You can overtax yourself and your bike. Good idea to give your family members the route, uh, your route or where you're going so they can contact you. And take two maps. Now, I'm not much of a believer of GPS, but I tell you, I, I was riding... Um, uh, from Los Angeles into San Francisco once and I pulled up to refuel the bike and the lid on the pannier, not this bike, another one, the pannier was loose and I thought, ah, oh, what's missing? My map was missing. But I had a speed right down the bottom of the pannier so I dug it out. Anyway, so then we're riding along and my missus is, she's not real good with maps. So she's, she goes like this with the map so you know you're in trouble. So I was trying to read the map at night coming into San Francisco, and you can't stop anywhere on those freeways. So I had it tucked under my legs, and we're riding along, riding along, and then my missus goes, what was that? Uh, that was the last map. So, so even so, two maps, I always find it's a good idea to take a second one. So you're just prepared. And obviously, excellent, um, prepared in the wet weather. You know, when we went around Australia, it was... 50 degrees up north, but when we came back across the Nullarbor, it was like sub-zero. So, you know, you've got to work out where you're going. You know on a motorcycle, the weather's going to vary. So, you know, just be prepared for that. There's just a couple of things I want to say about um, riding tips. Sometimes, too, on old bikes, speedos aren't real good. I found this thing here. This is unreal. I can even... Uh, it's got big letters. I can almost read it without glasses on. And this is just a speedo, GPS. It's great. Let's you know how fast you're going. Doesn't give you mileage or anything, but man, it's handy. Um, one big thing I've always found: leave early, finish early. So quite often, what I've always done is kick off in the morning. Don't have your breakfast. I go to the first town. And if you're out in the central Australia or around, sometimes you might be doing I don't know five five hundred k's in a day. But if you go 150 kilometres to the first town, have your breakfast, you've knocked over a 30 a trip, and you're only having breakfast, and it's nine o'clock in the morning. I always start 7:30, 7 7:30. It just breaks the day so much, and then you get in early. And when you get in early, then you've got time to check your bike over, sit down, go through, check all your spokes, check your chains, check your battery just gives you time to sit down and relax and do those things. You know, I know one time we were coming down, the, down towards um, Broome and it was 
uh, God, it's been so hot and we had this little scabby salt bush. We were trying to get a bit of shade under it and we're having a beer and checking the bikes. Guy comes up and he goes, oh, you're in luck. I said, why is that? He said, it's cooled off to 45 degrees. So <laughs> you don't want to be out there riding too long in it. So, you know, you get a bit of a rest. Um, unlike me, don't be afraid to ask directions. I'm not real good at it, but my missus nags me if I don't. So, you know, and it sometimes is a big help and you get to speak to the locals and see what's going on. Don't ride too close. I went round Australia with a guy, fair dinkum. He was from here to you to me, behind me, the whole way round Australia. You can see five kilometres out there and he's right up your clacker. You know, it's dangerous. If something comes out in front of you, it could be anything, something on the road, and there's plenty of animals out there, and there's no need to be so close. You, know, you just spread it out and relax and take your time. You can see five kilometres easily and see your mate up front, so, you know, and stay hydrated. I get a little bit of stuff from uh, push bike ideas. You see, I've got a, a water bottle carrier on here. This is fantastic, just for water bottle, and then when I do big trips, I carry two. Um, really good to keep the hydration levels up. And this is another thing off um, push bikes. I use um, these little tyre pumps. They'll pump to 120 psi. Small, light, you get a flat tyre, you pump your tyres up on the side, change your tyre, pump it up, and away you go. So. And sometimes a lot of the dirt bike guys who are riding across the Simpson and things like that, they don't want to carry two tubes. Quite often they'll just carry a 21 for the front. Now I know it doesn't fit an 18 rear, but you can pack it in there, push it in there in an emergency if you've got two different size tyres and pump it up and get you to the next town. If you carry a rear one, it won't fit in the front if you've got a big discrepancy of tyres. So, you know, if you just can fit one in, I mean, I always carry one tube, but these, they're the same. So... Just a, just a hint. Um, good idea to pick a sensible distance to go, as I said. I mean, I did that ridiculous trip to Flinders Ranges and back in a, in a weekend. And it's ludicrous. But, um, so and the idea is to ride smarter and not harder. Just take it, take it easy, plan your trip, you know, and you'll always have, get there and you'll have a great relaxing time. Inspect your bike often. Sit down, have a look at it, have a fiddle with it. Sit down, have a beer when you've stopped. Just take your time. Get into a routine. Check, this, check it all the time. You know, we found a few things wrong when we were travelling around Oz and you know, there was no drama. We just fixed them. Away we go, you know. Watch out for trucks. Now, the big thing to watch out for, it, you know what a cattle crate is? You should. If you're following a cattle crate and they're the ones that carry stock, from the back, they look exactly the same as a Pantech. But if you get too close and it's starting to rain and there's no clouds, you know it's not rain. I only did that once in the 70s, but I learned cattle crates, pick them early and stay way back. And when you're passing them, right hand line early and go like hell. <laughs> because it's, it's miserable. <laughs> and... Uh, when I was saying too before about a fresh change of clothes, I remember we were coming back across the Hay Plains once and it was a, a locust plague. We were completely covered in locusts and I can tell you after a couple of hours, they stink bad. And went into a service station and we, they just parted the ways. It was just rotting on us in, in summer, you know. And it, <laughs> so change of clothes, good idea. Trucks on the, no, trucks on the Nullarbor. Be very careful. Um, I found on this bike, I didn't have a speedo on this bike for 25 years. And um, so, I, you know, I went to Perth and back a couple of times without a speedo. And I was coming back across the Nullarbor and there's a road train. So I'm sitting there cruising along and the road train's starting to pass me. And I'm thinking, he's taking his time to go past me. Why is he taking so long? And what had happened was all the draft around the truck had picked me up in speed. And I didn't have a speedo, I didn't know. He was sucking me along, he couldn't get past. So when I realised that, I just backed her off and he got in. So just sort of be careful of the trucks. They're really good. Trucks got, truck drivers are great. But 
you know, just work around. And they're also a wonderful source. These bikes have got heaps of grease nipples. I never carry a grease gun. Every time you see a truck in a, in a road stop, I just go and ask, can I borrow a grease gun? Sure, grease them up. Works. Well, they're happy to help you and have a bit of a yak, you know. And um, one thing, one thing too, when I say start early, finish early, I, I remember I was coming back once from, um, I stayed at the... Uh, Stockman's Hall of Fame at Longreach and I was heading back towards Charleville and the wife and I were um, looking there and we spent a little bit too long there. We didn't leave there till 1.30. By the time we went back to Charleville, it was dark and, you, and the kangaroos were like ants. They were just everywhere and they were running in family groups of three, four, five, up to seven in a line and they just come straight across the road like that. And we were just frantic. So I'd slowed down to 40 kilometres... Um, down to 80 kilometres an hour for a long period of time. I could see a set of headlights coming behind me. I thought, oh, they'll catch up and I'll jump on behind them. Over one hour, we were doing 80 kilometres an hour till this four-wheel drive caught us, and there was that many kangaroos. I didn't have enough time to look on both sides of the road, so my, my wife was looking on the left-hand side of the road. She see roos, she tapped me, or I was looking on the right, and we were just dodging roos. It was frantic, I tell you. It's, anyway, this four-wheel drive came past at 120 k's, I jumped straight onto the back of it. Just then a family of roos came straight on. What a mess. Cars going everywhere. I'm trying to stop, not hit the four-wheel drive. There's roos going everywhere. Oh. So this is why it's important. Start early, finish early. Get off the road. Don't ride in that country. There's just so many. It's just unbelievable. So um, any questions? Enjoy your touring.